Tap the power. Make the most important financial decision of your life, which is to stop trading time for money to become an owner, not just to somebody who is you know, buying things, but somebody who has become an investor. And the way you have to do that is by deciding a percentage you're going to save and you're going to keep that and put it into a financial freedom fund. You're going to take that money before you see it, put it aside, and you're going to invest it. In fact, most people describe what happens with, let's say, a fighter, uh, even somebody as, as brilliant as Money Mayweather. Brilliant guy. Unbelievable fighter. But, you know, if you talk to nobody less than 50 Cent, his former friend and partner, he said, let me tell you what he does. He goes out and he fights. He gets the money. He spends the money and then he fights. He said, and you know, he carries around a Louis Vuitton bag full of literally a million dollars in cash just in case anything special happens he wants to take advantage of. So God forbid if something happens to this man and his ability to fight, he could be in real trouble. We can't do that. And it's easy to make fun of somebody else and go, well, look at what they're doing. But don't most Americans really like, instead of fight, say work, earn the money, spend the money, work, that cycle is the worst cycle on earth, and that's the cycle I want to get you out of right now today by tapping the power and making step one the most important investment decision in your life. So what the heck is it? Well, what if you decided that you were no longer going to be a financial trader? What are you talking about, Tony? I'm not a financial trader. I don't invest in stocks. I don't, I don't do that stuff all day long. Most Americans are financial traders, even though they don't think of themselves that way. Why? Because if you're trading time for money, you're making the worst financial trade in the world. Your goal, and the goal I have for you with this book, is to make money your slave. You want money to work for you, so you don't have to. Until that happens, you'll always have some level of uncertainty, or fear, or stress, or insecurity because there's only so many things that can happen that mess up your income flow and you're in trouble. What would it feel like if you could build what I would call a money machine? Something that made money while you slept. Something that literally every day of your life, even if you weren't working, could provide you an income without ever having to work again. Because see, I ask people all the time, what are you investing for? And people say, well, I, I don't know, I'm doing my 401k so someday I can retire. Or I'm investing so that I can get, you know, more assets or a bigger nest egg. No, you're not. You're investing for one thing and one thing only. You're investing because you want an income. You want an income that will last longer than you live. In fact, I mentioned before, the number one fear of baby boomers today is that not they're going to die. That's their number two fear. The number one fear is I want to run out of money while I'm alive. And millennials have the same fear because according to statistics, about 70 to 75% of the people are going to run out of money before they die. And we're all living longer. So the chance of that happening is off the charts unless you and I create a money machine. What does that mean? It's really simple. The most important financial decision of your life is deciding that a portion of all the money you earn in your life is yours to keep, that you're not going to give it up. It's for you and for your family, and you're going to keep a portion of what you earn forever, and you're going to grow it, that you're not going to give it to, you know, Kate Spade. You're not going to give it to The Gap. You're not going to give it to whoever you normally gave it to. You're going to keep that for yourself, and you're going to grow it into something that literally will make it so you don't have to work as long as you live. I call it a money machine because it's really simple. If you were just thinking of yourself right now as you're a money machine, if you take a look at this graphic, here you are, you work your tail off, and what happens? You use your efforts to get money. You trade time for money. You take work and effort for money. But what if you just did something so simple? You already know to do it. You're just not probably doing it the level that you could. What if you made a decision that a percentage of what you earn, you're never going to see it, it's just going to instantly and automatically be put into building this money machine where you're going to take a portion of what you earn, 10%, 15%, 8%, 20%. You get to decide the number, but a portion of what you earn, no matter what, before you ever see it, 
It's almost like a tax, but the tax is paid to you instead of the government. The tax is for your future self. The tax is about creating financial freedom. So you're not like most people who can end up their life being stressed out all the time, where you're the person who can do what you want, when you want, where you want, with whomever you want, because you got freedom. How do you get there? You take a portion of this money that you've done right now and you've earned, you automatically start to fill up this money machine. Problems need energy to live. I want you to own that. Remember this, problems need energy to live. And so the concept should be that we solve problems, but we don't have to pour and deplete ourselves of energy. Because the more energy you give something, the more it expands. We want to be in the max out universe. We want to pour our energy and expense our energy towards the solution, not towards the problem. So the first thing I want you to write down is 90% of your energy, focus, time, and thought should be towards the solution, not towards the problem itself. This is a mistake most people make because they expend all the energy into the problem. They obsess over the problem, the problem. And when you expand energy, it grows to survive. And the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and the solution becomes more and more difficult. So the first thing is, can you consciously begin to focus on energy expansion into the solution, 90% of it into the solution and not into the problem? What we do is we repeat that problem over and over and over again, and we magnify it to the point where we don't come up with realistic solutions and we deplete ourselves as energy towards the solution. And so focus going forward, when a problem arises, a challenge arises, that you focus 90% of your energy and thoughts on the solution and not repeating the problem to yourself. There's three areas of your life that, you know, I think are important, right? One is um, really mastering uh, your your mind, right? Your thought process. And, uh, and that's nothing new. The real question is, you know, at one level, how do we become more self-aware of the thoughts that are driving all of our process? But more importantly, how do we change our thinking? How do we change the habitual patterns of thinking that we become addicted to? And so that then cascades into you know our emotional responses that we have with with life around us and and our and our perceptions. So how do we reorient ourselves in a way that is congruent with the life that we actually want to create, or the business that we want to create, or the relationships that we want to create, or the, the health that we want to have? Uh, because we tend to just continue to experience the same experiences over and over and over and over. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with us in the fact that, that we live this sort of Bill Murray, Groundhog Day type of existence, right? It's, it's the way the technology and the operating system of the human beings have been designed. But now we're entering this really interesting uh, period where I think personal growth is evolving into the next level where we're able to utilize the tech to really tap into higher levels of intelligence and become, you know, what a lot of people refer to as superhuman. So what gets people stuck in the first place? There are a number of things that get people stuck. I mean, let's talk about beliefs for a second. You know, what are beliefs? Beliefs are the meanings that we gave the experiences of our life, mostly before the age of seven, before a significant portion of the prefrontal cortex is fully formed we gave meanings to the experiences of our life or other people gave meanings to the experiences that we were having, right? I remember distinctly one time, um, I grew up in Orange County, California, and I don't know why in first grade they had to choose which mission we wanted to build along, uh, you know, we had Mission San Juan Capistrano. So at a, at a, at a paper mache and clay, I'm building Mission San Juan Capistrano in, in my garage, and my dad walks in and he says, hey, let me show you a better way to do that. Uh, the meaning I gave that experience was I didn't know how to do it right. And just because of the way the technology works, what happens is that starts to shape the lens through which we experience the future experiences of our life. So the next time you have an experience, you know, you're approaching that experience through the not knowing how to do it right. And because the brain is a goal achieving machine, that's all we start to notice, right? It's what we're not doing right. And in really no recognition of what we're doing well. So we get caught in this, in this psycho-cybernetic loop. And if you're not aware of it, there's really no way out of it because in every new experience, you're just gonna continue to focus on that which reinforces the belief systems that you established or the meaning that you gave the experiences early on, and you're gonna ignore everything else. You, you become trapped, right? In, in By this, your own 
thoughts. Buy your own thoughts, buy, buy your own belief systems. And now we're really understanding that those, those meanings aren't just some sort of uh, like marshmallow fluff or kind of esoteric concept. They're actually wired into the neural networks of your brain. Like we can't do that today, but in the future I would imagine we'd be able to brain scan you and go, oh, those are the neural networks that light up when you feel like there's not enough time or money's hard to make or you're not good enough or you're not as far along as you should be. And for years I you know, struggled in the current model of personal growth because you know, it's, it's one of those things where like the, the, the current model lends to self-awareness. And when I'm speaking on stages, I say, you know, how many of you are aware now of your limiting beliefs? And everybody raises their hands and say, how many of you have done the events? You've done the programs, you've done the coaching, you've done the different protocols, you've done the modalities. And make no mistake, I'm not criticizing them, right? This is an evolution of our own ability to change ourselves. And everybody raises their hand, right? They've been in the work, but now they're acutely self-aware and they have no idea what to do about the patterns of thinking that they're aware of that are causing the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm and holding them back. So that's where I was at one point. And, and, and if there was like a question or a, or a quest I was on, it was how do I go beyond self-awareness and actually begin to change the way I think? You look around you at the people you admire, you know, they have certain qualities. I mean, you've got, you've got friends, why do you like them? You know, generally, you know, they, 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 generally they have an upbeat attitude on life. Generally, they are generous people. They're humorous people. They're people that do more than their share. They're people that are thinking about something nice they can do for you. And all of those qualities attract you. And none of those are, are innate at birth. I mean, you, you can acquire those. And then there's other people that turn you off. You know, and, and uh, uh, they have habits, they take credit for things they didn't do, they don't show up on time, whatever it may be. They're a little dishonest about things. And if you're looking at your life at, at a young age like you are, and you can choose what kind of a person you can be, why not be the person you admire rather than the person you can't stand? It's so simple. So just write down the qualities you like. Take your, take your five best friends. Why do you like them? And just write down those qualities. And you will find there's no quality there that you can't have yourself. And similarly with the five people you can't stand to be around, <laughs> put, those, put those things down that turn you off about those people. And if they turn you off about them, why should you possess them? You're gonna, it's, it's so simple. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not... It's, it's not. It's not like some something complicated that you think you should be learning <laughs> with an advanced it's not degree as complicated in school. as investing in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's enormously important to have people work with you in life. Right. They're going to work with you in life if they like you. You know, and they may occasionally. I mean, if you're in the army or something, you know, you may work for somebody that you don't like. But by and large, you're going to get the best out of people if they feel good about you. And it's just so easy, but you've got to develop the habits early because you can't say I'm gonna suddenly become a terribly attractive person when I'm 60. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Uh, so pick up the right habits now. And I will guarantee you, if you actually just write down those qualities and think about it, you will find you can have every one of the attractive qualities, get rid of the ones that are, that are negative that's and your life will be different. I think if a Michael Francis was a father figure type, probably, and I would have probably done a pretty good job at it. Fascinating. Yeah. If I had a father figure like a Michael or a Sonny or one of those guys, most likely. Gotcha. Do you think you think like a gangster at times? You have to. You, uh, there's no question about it. In the business world? Sure. Oh, you have to think that way. Interesting. Oh, you have to, especially uh, in the world of, look, we're, we're, we're friends, we're compelled, you know, we may talk here, but within your world, the bigger you get, there's a lot of people that are not happy about y your brand getting bigger. Sure. You open up more gyms. This is not exciting to a lot of other people that own gyms. It's not even exciting to somebody that runs a different model when it comes down to franchising. Right. So you're not helping people, it's helping competitors. You're hurting them. Sure. And when it comes down to it, if it's between your five locations versus my five locations, they are going to be competitive. So you get in the world of business being very 
everybody wants to help, everybody's this, and then you realize there's a part of it that some of the people would take their side over you any day. Sometimes you can be blessed and be unhappy because even though things are going right, they're not going according to what you had believed and expected and you know that something is missing out of your life. What do you do when something is missing out of your life and the things that replaced it do not compensate for what you lost? If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? Why you're doing it? Because you know what? You may get a big goal as soon as I want to make a billion dollars. I want to bring peace to the earth. Why? Because as soon as you come up with a goal, all the obstacles show up. There are moments in our lives that we feel completely alone. We feel as though no one knows what we're going through. It is because of the uniqueness of the challenges that confront you are so unique to you that you feel like I'm up against it all by myself. So you got to get yourself past that. The way to get past that is have enough reasons. Reasons come first, answers come second. To ask intelligent, you got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen. What is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans that if the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. In what you've done with your life thus far, is it giving you what you want? Is it giving you what you want? When you look toward the future, when you look at all that's going on out here, is there some place within yourself you say, hey, I know I need to be out there in that arena. I know I can do more than what I've been doing. Is that something that you begin to look at within yourself? See, I say if you look at your life, and if you're not getting what you want, you owe it to yourself to do something differently. If you want a job, 85% of Americans go to jobs that they're unhappy. If you're doing something eight hours a day that you don't like, it's not giving you what you want, it's not giving you a strong feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment, if that's what it is, you owe it to yourself to start strategically working to change directions. And generally, that type of circumstance is born because it's not because you don't have anybody to talk to, but can you trust them? Eventually, even the most disciplined amongst us, the corners of your mouth will droop down. Your smile will turn into a frown. Eventually, even if you have to wait till everybody's gone to sleep, a tear will run across the bridge of your nose because you're dealing with stuff that is so deep and so complicated that you feel like you're in it by yourself. But you are not alone in the battle. You're not alone in the struggle that God has a strategy. And when it's all over, you're going to see that even though you couldn't see him, he was there all the time. Most people will resist change. Most people will fight change as if change would be worse than what they're experiencing. Most people will not challenge the unknown. They won't just step out there. See, there are certain things that's got to be in place. They've got to see it all together. And life isn't like that. That's not how you grow. As you begin to look toward the future, begin to know that whatever it takes for you to create that, you got that. You've got genius in you, you've got goodness in you. If you decide to take the initiative to change the current quality of your life, I say to you that you will find that the universe is on your side. I've always been told how average I can be. Always been criticized about being average. But I wanna tell you something. I stand here before you, not listening to those words but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars, to be the best that I can be. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better, and better isn't good enough if it can be best. Turn your wounds into wisdom. You will be wounded many times in your life. You'll make mistakes. 
Some people will call them failures. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. Other than death, all failure is psychological. Other than death, all failure is psychological. Think about that. If you aren't dead, then it's just psychological. Does not mean that you won't lose some battles because you will, we all will. But it does mean that as long as you don't surrender, as long as you don't give up, as long as you don't quit, then you haven't failed. It just means you've made a temporary tactical retreat, a brief withdrawal so that you can regroup and reattack. If you get beat, unless you're dead, you are not defeated and you have not failed. What you've done is you've learned, you've gained experience and you're still alive. So get up and go get after it. We all live in this bubble. What you got to do to get the life that God wants you to have, you got to put more air in your bubble. You got to blow your bubble up. Expand yourself. Take yourself out your comfort zone. Put some more air in your bubble. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. You will fail in your comfort zone. Success is not a comfortable procedure. It is a very uncomfortable thing to attempt. So you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable if you ever want to be successful. People say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. And it's totally true. And the reason is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, at the ones that ended up, you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere, you know, when it got really tough. And the ones that didn't love it quit. So it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of worrying constantly. If you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you got to love it. You got to have passion. If you think ordinary is cool, ain't no problem. It's some really wonderful ordinary people. But if you are sitting in this room and you have extraordinary aspirations, then you're going to have to do extra. You put extra on top of ordinary and you come up with extraordinary. It's no other way. But here's the fact. All of you have extraordinary capabilities. All of you. You have to decide if you are willing to do the things to put you in that category. Rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. That's a third of your life. He who loves to sleep and the folding of hands, poverty will set upon you like a thief in the night. You don't have to live worried, focused on the problems, wondering why it happened. You know a secret, you have favor in the storm. You know what was meant for harm, he's turning to your advantage. Here's the key. The enemy wouldn't be fighting you if you weren't a threat. Oh, get ready. Favor is about to turn things around. Favor is about to catapult you to a new level. Favor is not going to keep you from the storm, but favor will bring you out of the storm. We don't understand everything that happens. Sometimes life is not fair, but you have to trust that God knows what he's doing. This thing called life, you just don't know what the next moment will bring. But here's what I do know, and I want you to know, you have comeback power. When something happens to you, don't buy into what has happened to you. Buy into, I'm getting up out of here. I'm going to change this situation. This does not work for me. And I don't have the luxury of being depressed and angry. I need to clear my head. This is no time to do something stupid, like hurt yourself. No, 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 no. So get serious about your goals, business goals, financial goals, financial independence goals, family goals. I mean, there's so many things to work on on this. If you don't get busy and work on it, sure enough, the time will pass. And sure enough, five years from now, you'll wind up where you don't want to be, wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, being what you don't want to be. Now's the time to fix it. 
Your goals are affecting you, whatever they are. Your goals affect your attitude, personality. All day long, we're being affected by our goals. You got to clear your head so that the decision that you make represents the best in you. People who don't stop to clear their heads, they react. They don't respond. Be still and know that you're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. And you don't want to be radical. You don't want to be erratic. Just be still and know, I'm going to get through this. You got to assure yourself. You have to encourage yourself. You have to clear your mind. Your better future is a dream. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. Without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for. Take the crumbs from starving soldiers, they won't die. Take the bread from hungry children, they won't cry. But without dreams, we all will die. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dream. Becoming something unique on your journey here, don't lose your dream. That's long-range goals. You've got to have those. Because if you set up something short-range, go for it. Get it. Latch, latch onto it. Work hard. Accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dreams. Economics plays a major role in everybody's life, which means it ought to be meticulously well-planned for tomorrow. The area of life that matters clearly to all of us is time. And most people have very little mastery of this. I don't mean checking things off your list. I'm meaning squeezing out of your life what matters to you most. Your career, where is it now? And where are you financially compared to where you want to be? And especially with some of the changes that have happened in the economies around the world. And then finally, where are you in your level of sense of meaning, of contribution, and your sense of celebration in life? These are the areas that really matter most. Sit down and define what this looks like for you today. And invariably what we find out is almost everybody has some gaps. Gaps between where you are and where you want to be. And even if you've done incredibly well, I mean, I deal with some of the most successful people in the world, they're usually still happy in their life because they're hungry. They haven't lost that drive that says, look, what makes me feel alive is to know I'm growing. You know, if my life's going to get better, I got to get better. I can't just hope it. And if my life is going to be rich emotionally, it's got to be expanding. And they know that. If you work your tail off at work to take care of your family and be the best at what you can do, your career's going really well. Isn't that the nature of human beings? To me, successful is getting to the point where you are absolutely comfortable with yourself. It does not matter how many things you have acquired. Uh, the ability to learn to say no and not to feel guilty about it, to me, is about the greatest success I have achieved. Uh, the fact that I have, you know, in the public side, done whatever, it's all a part of a process for growing for me. But to me, to have the, in, the kind of internal strength and internal courage it takes to say, no, I will not let you treat me this way, is what success is all about. I will not be treated this way. I demand only the best for myself. We tend to focus on things we feel confident in, we know what to do in, and the other stuff we kind of hope it all comes together and try not to think about it too much, but it all affects us. You gotta start with what it is you really, truly want now. You gotta start with that end in mind. And then once you understand there is a gap between where you are and where you wanna be, here's all we do. We believe that the most powerful way to change anything is total immersion. No matter what happens to you, it ain't over. As long as God wakes you up, that means he ain't through with you yet. And if he wakes you up, you got a shot to correct it and get it right. And he kept waking me up. So I figured, okay, God wakes you up. That also means that he has something for you that you've yet to receive. You can take my car, I can get another one. You can take my house, I can get another house. But when you take my time, you have taken something from me that is totally irreplaceable. Even if you are 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 doesn't matter. You're in the game now and that's what counts. And all those quote unquote wasted years, they, they weren't wasted because you learned. Learn about what it's like to be weak and the knowledge that you learned about those things, 
is fuel to make sure that it never happens again. Because you know, you know what is out there. And you know how bad it can get. I say you embrace what you learned from the weekdays. Let them make you even stronger. And you use your own personal transformation that you've made in life. Use that to help other people transform and get on the path as well. If you know what it is to have the kind of pain that feels as if you cannot be confident, if you know what it is to be at the end of your robe and feel like your life is over and you've got questions that cannot be answered and you're confused and you're uncertain, you need to learn this verse, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I will never uh, forget there have been many opportunities in my life that I have grappled with grief and pain it's so unbearable and so overwhelming that I thought that I would never smile again. I've seen days that were so dark for me that I thought there could not possibly be a silver lining in the clouds that hung over my head. I've seen days and weeks and months that drug me so low that I gave up all hope of getting up again. But in the midst of all of that despair and that trouble and that trauma and that pain there was in the basement of my soul this one word win when should you start the day as soon as you have it finished plan the day the best you can leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day but if you've planned a good productive day now you start that day you can't believe how much more value Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it To the it best of your ability. It can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go. And it might get all upset. It might get torn up and you do a new one. You make so much progress the first 90 days that now you've got, you've multiplied it all by two, by three. Because that happened to me. I thought, wow, here's how, this is going to be a great year. By the time I'd finished the third month, I'm rolling. So many things are happening. I revised my whole year's plan. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because you remember now, you don't have to do anything. So I say, well, i got to get a handle on my time. The answer is, no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Take charge of your life. Take charge of your time. Take charge of your resources, which we're going to talk about next. Take charge of your health. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. You will be okay. There's nothing has been wasted. Like I say, successful people don't make the right decisions, they make their decisions right. And you have an opportunity right now to make things right inside and out. When you say you're depressed, you've got to understand that depression is the opposite of expression. So what you're literally doing is stuffing down and depressing something that wants to come up and rise up. I wouldn't be surprised if you had like jaw, ear, or neck pain having to do with expressing yourself, speaking your truth. So, yeah, you're depressing yourself. Stop it. Speak up. Speak your truth. Now, right, once you get that off your chest, now it's time to turn the flashlight in and discover what your truth is. We are living in a generation of the dumbing down of ideas. Because we have traded effectiveness for busyness. We are so busy and we think because we're busy, we're effective. But I want you to challenge your schedule for a minute and ask yourself, are you really being effective? Or is your life cluttered with all kinds of stuff that demands you and drains you and stops you from being your highest and best self? And are you substituting busyness and all the chaos that goes along with busyness from being effective? It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, Oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. 
Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. So don't mistake movement for achievement. There's a lot of things you could take from me and I could make it. You could take my suit, I got another one. You could take my car, I could get another one. You could take my house, I could get another house. But when you take my time, you have taken something from me that is totally irreplaceable. We do everything except the most important thing is to value our time. It takes time to be creative. You were meant to be creative. You have creativity. If you had time, you would be creative. Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. Well, you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day, you're ready to go. What you do is you specify your long-term ideal. You do that in some sense as a unique individual. You want to specify goals that make you say, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. The question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. So you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence. And you need a family. You need friends. Like, you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are, that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things well then all you've got left is misery and suffering so that's a bad that's a bad deal for you don't mistake courtesy for consent if somebody's pleasant and they nod you say oh they're gonna buy no they're courteous you can't mistake courtesy for consent now here's a big one concentration i had to learn this all those years ago i'm in the shower trying to compose a letter found it turns out to be a strange letter so here's what i learned to do save the work till you get to the office save the work till you get to the work don't try to get to the office on the way to work on the way to work enjoy the way in the shower enjoy the shower then go to work when you get to work concentration learn to say no i'm telling you in such a social society we have now it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes 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 to everything find yourself overloaded now you got to call and make the well gosh you know all the time it takes to back out of something that you should said yes to too quickly here's what might be better i don't think so but if that changes i'll call you little things you can use not to commit over commit yourself but once you set up that goal structure let's say and that's really who it is that you're trying to be, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be, I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are going to overlap. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. I would recommend that you don't let that happen. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living. Anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's gonna be some suffering and loss involved in all of that. The goal is to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. It's not a bloody prison. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, what would it look like? What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. The senses are decoding systems, decoding information into a form that the brain can uh, decode. So the senses are taking waveform information, vibrational information, 
they're turning into electrical information, they are communicating it to the brain, which then decodes that into a sense of reality we call the world we live in. So the world that we think we're living in exists there. The brain is dark but sees light. How is that possible? How can my brain be totally dark and I see this light? Because that light in its prime form, like everything else, is just an information source. And I am decoding that information source in here into the visual reality of light because that's what the information contains. Thus, that's what it manifests when I decode it. This is mainstream science. They talk about dark energy, dark matter. I see that slightly differently, but the principle is the same, what you can see and what you can't see. So you have this massive area of stuff they say exists in this universe, which we can't see. You then have light, electromagnetic spectrum, etc., which is 5% of what they say exists in this universe, and visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can decode into a visual reality. This is the visible spectrum within the electromagnetic spectrum. Look at it, it's tiny, and that's all that we can see. So, this is right. There is no spoon. It's not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. Because that spoon only exists in that form when you decode it from energetic information. Information is encoded in what we call light. White light contains all the colors of the spectrum. And colors are frequencies. They're just different frequencies. And when we decode them, we see that color. And we, we think those flowers are red and Yellow, they're not. Nothing has any color. The color is decided in our perception of it. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so, when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called a mood. You say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months, that's called temperament. Why is he so bitter? I don't know, let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you bitter? Well, I had this thing happen to me nine months ago. And if you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And so learning how to shorten your refractory period of emotional reactions is really where the, where the work starts. So then People, when they have an event, what they do is they keep recalling the event because the, the emotions of stress hormones, the survival emotions, are saying pay attention to what happened because you want to be prepared if it happens again. Turns out most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress. So they're, they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience and they're literally out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear and they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, the body has a panic attack without you. you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. And what that means from a biological standpoint is that they haven't been able to change since that event. So then the emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits, and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body's believing. It's living in the same past experience 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts, and they do, and then those thoughts create the same emotions, and those same emotions influence the same thoughts, now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past. So then the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It, there's going to be some why, uncertainty. Why does it feel so uncomfortable? Is it because of the, the, the neurons of fire together, wire together, so I've, there's like an easiness to that loop? Just because literally, and you've talked very eloquently about this, the way that the neurons connect in the brain, how rapidly, I've seen you show footage of how yeah. rapidly those connections happen, which is pretty incredible. Um, is, is that what makes it so discomforting for people? I think that I think that the bigger thing is that we we keep firing and wiring those circuits they become more hardwired so there you have a thought and then the program runs but it's the emotion that follows the thought if you have a if you have a fearful thought you're going to feel anxiety the moment you feel anxiety your brain's checking in with your body and saying yeah you're pretty anxious so then you start thinking more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel well, the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind. So now, when it comes time to change, a person steps into that river of change and they make a different choice and all of a sudden, they don't, they, they, they don't feel the same way. So the body says, well, you've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, I just stop feel, suffering and stop feeling guilty and stop feeling shameful and you're not going to complain or blame or make excuses or feel sorry for yourself. Well, <laughs> the body's in the unknown. So the body says, I want to return back to familiar ter territory. So the body starts influencing the mind and it says, start tomorrow. You're too much like your mother. You'll never change. This isn't going to work for you. This doesn't feel right. Uh, and so if you respond to that thought as if it's true, that same thought will lead to the same choice, which will lead to the same behavior, which will create the same experience, which will produce the same emotion when you are moving away from yourself, as long as you're moving back towards your universal essence, your harmony with yourself, your cooperation with the rest, things will start happening in ways that you never dreamt of. And we, it's, it's a term that we use to, to explain how unexplainable coincidences sort of happen in our life and how come these things happen. I'm gonna share a couple of those with you before we leave. The, the quality versus appearance in your life means that you get that inner candle flame working in a way that gives you quality, independent of what other people think of you. Maslow in defining, self-actualizing, no limit people said, they are independent of the good opinion of other people. Of the good opinion of other people. Independent of it. They're so busy advancing confidently, doing the things that make sense, and bringing success to changing their baby's diaper and bringing success to weeding their garden and bringing it to the job. They bring it on the airplane so that when they run into somebody who is, who is rude to them, a stewardess that is rude, they don't see it as an attack on them. It's just where they are and they send them love. Help them a little bit, you know. They're kind. To, when somebody wants to get in on the freeway, it is, it's a new way of being. It's a way of quality where your harmony allows you to cooperate and you are a part of what this whole thing is about. New way of being, quality rather than appearances. Another new way of being, very important. Living your life on ethics rather than rules. All these rules, all these ways of having to do things, somebody else dictates to them. Do you know that some of the most immoral acts in the world have been perpetrated in the name of the rules? These are the laws. What do you think Nazi Germany was all about? Everybody doing all these horrible things to other people. I'm only doing my job was the defense we all heard at Nuremberg. I was just doing my job. If it's an immoral rule, it's immoral to obey it. And self-actualizing people, as Maslow tells us, have rules inside of them that they could never obey, never disobey, ever. And they have to do with ethics, how you treat people. How do you think we get to where we are now? You know who Rosa Parks was? The woman in the South, the black woman in the South who said, not today, I'm not going to the back today. No way. I know what the rules are. The rules were all over the place. If you, didn't need, if you needed a reminder, there were signs every place, colored in the back. 
white in the front. And she said, no, I'm sitting here. And that made all the difference. Ethics, not rules. When your children start disobeying rules that need to be disobeyed, don't be surprised.